Business is battle. By looking closely at entrepreneurial battles like our latest series of business wars, KFC vs. Chick-fil-A, we learn what it takes to win. Our new book, The Art of Business Wars, gets to the very heart of each conflict to unearth all the valuable lessons to be found there. Go to Wondery.com slash The Art of Business Wars to order your copy now. Join Wondery Plus to listen to Business Wars one week early and ad-free in the Wondery app. Download the Wondery app in your Apple or Google Play mobile app store today. A note to listeners, this episode contains adult content and language. It's a muggy summer day in 1975 on the banks of Otter Creek, 25 miles south of Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky Fried Chicken CEO Barry Rolls wades into the rushing water and casts a fly upstream. He's 48 and decked out in waders, khaki fishing vest, and a hat studded with lures. John Brown, his predecessor at Kentucky Fried Chicken, is standing at the shoreline. Muddy water is seeping into his penny loafers. Rowles reels his line back in. John, you didn't have to rush out here on a Saturday just to talk about Sanders' wife's new restaurant. It's trademark infringement, pure and simple. They called it the Colonel's Ladies' Dinner House, and he serves Kentucky Fried Chicken. We had to sue him. Four years ago, Brown merged Kentucky Fried Chicken with Connecticut-based Highblind Inc., a beverage company. He's still on the company's board and has come to love and respect Sanders. Brown bends over and scrapes some mud off the toe of his shoe. Look, you're right to call him on using his name and the company name. I understand that you can't let him get away with setting a precedent. But you have to understand, the colonel is still important to this company. Every time he shows his face, people go crazy. And he's not just a made-up rags-to-riches story. He's the real deal. He's what makes our company different. Rouse casts his fly near the other side of the creek. We're not a one-man show, John. This is a corporation. We have to cut costs and change products. Like the colonel's gravy. Our chemists say it's way too expensive and it takes a chef with a culinary arts degree to make it. And people think the colonel's a joke. Some looney tune dressed up like a circus act. (sighs) He's 85. He's not going to be around much longer. Why not show some loyalty and settle this lawsuit out of court? Doesn't matter what we sign. He'll blow up over something. Brown shakes his head. Then get ready. I expect he'll come at you with a double-barrel lawsuit. And Sanders will do just that. He's determined not to let a global conglomerate destroy what he spent a lifetime building. But the lawsuit is just his opening volley. He's itching to lob another bombshell that he hopes will blow Kentucky Fried Chicken off the top perch. From Wondery, I'm David Brown and this is Business Wars. In the last episode, new management at Kentucky Fried Chicken rapidly expanded the franchise and set Colonel Sanders on a warpath with his own company. Meanwhile, newcomer Chick-fil-A cornered the mall market while Popeyes drew customers with a taste for heat. Now, in the midst of the oil crisis of the 1970s, the U.S. economy is in a tailspin. Inflation is flaring at nearly 20% and people are losing jobs. The house the colonel built is coming apart. Revenues tumble, and franchisees complain that quality is suffering. All of this angst at Highblind provides an opening for Chick-fil-A and Popeyes, which have been growing across the South like kudzu vine. This is Episode 5, The Colonel's Last Stand. Just as Brown predicted, Sanders countersues Highline for $122 million, and that makes headlines across the nation. Brown shuttles back and forth between the warring parties trying to make peace. He gets Highline to agree to a million-dollar settlement for Sanders 
if the colonel promises to stop embarrassing the company. But then Sanders insists they take his name off a proposed new menu item, extra crispy chicken. Highblind ignores his demands and launches it anyway. Sanders goes ballistic and decides to take his beef with Highblind to the press. It's September 1976 in Greenwich Village, New York. Harlan Sanders sits in the back of a limo inching its way uptown in midday traffic. A New York Times food critic is next to him. He's giving her a ride back to the office after his 86th birthday party at the famous restaurant 21. The critic points out the window. Mr. Sanders, see that Kentucky Fried Chicken store over there? That's where I once purchased the worst fried chicken of my life. Would you be willing to come with me to perform an unannounced inspection? It could make a great column. Sanders has been venting his frustration over Highblind at the critic all morning. Now, he sees an opportunity to get some real revenge. Miss Sheraton, I would be delighted. The limo driver pulls over and Sanders and the critic walk into the restaurant. A small boy eating at a table with his mother sees Sanders and almost drops his extra crispy drumstick. Sanders points the end of his black cane at the store manager behind the counter. The young man has a gravy stain on his tie. You, sir, tuck in your shirt properly and put on an apron. Now let me see what's going on in your kitchen. The astonished manager nods and leads Sanders and the critic into the kitchen. Sanders stops in front of a vat of mashed potatoes. Tell me how you make them, boy. Um, I just do what I'm told, sir. I mix these instant powdered potatoes with water. Sanders shakes his cane at the poor kid. And then you have wallpaper paste, that's what you have. Next, I suppose you add some brown gravy stuff and then you have sludge. And that pale chicken over there, that's the worst fried chicken I've ever seen. The manager's lower lip trembles. He looks like he might burst into tears. Sanders pats him gently on the arm. Well, it's not your fault. You're just working for a company that doesn't know what it's doing. The colonel's white goateed face is now known around the world. The New York Times critics article about this scene causes a public relations tsunami. Sanders has drawn blood and Highblind can't afford the bad press in the midst of a recession. Between 1976 and 79, Highblind's revenues plunge 25%. Something's gotta give. It's 1977 in Salt Lake City International Airport. At gate three, Pete Harmon, Kentucky Fried Chicken's first franchisee, rocks impatiently on his heels. He's 58, runs 300 stores in five states, and serves on the High Blind Board. Inspired by Sanders, his longtime friend, he's taken to dressing in an old-fashioned frock coat and string tie. A man in a gray pinstripe suit emerges from the gate. It's Mike Miles, High Blind's new Kentucky Fried Chicken corporate division head. Miles walks over to Harmon, sets a suitcase down on the floor, and shakes his hand. He's here for Herman's infamous management training crash course. He's hoping the chain's top earner can give him tips on how to turn the company around. Pete, you didn't have to come and pick me up yourself. I thought you'd send a car and we could start fresh tomorrow morning. Harmon picks up the suitcase. Mike, we don't have time for that. We've got too much to do. Follow me. Harmon drives Miles to a nearby hotel and leads him into a conference room. There's coffee and sandwiches on a side table. Harmon walks to the blackboard and picks up a piece of chalk. Mike, help yourself to something to eat. Meanwhile, I'm going to get you acquainted with my core principles of how to run a franchise. For the next four hours, Harmon hammers on his central beliefs. Mike, here's my number one core value. Employees will go the extra mile if they're treated fairly. And number two, management should motivate, educate, and celebrate workers. Harmon has sayings like this framed and hanging prominently on the walls of his restaurants. And you've never actually worked a grill, but trust me, number four is a keeper. It's don't ever fire a cook on Friday night. Harmon puts hard cash behind his code, too. He's a pioneer of profit sharing in the industry and of promoting women to senior management positions. At one in the morning, 
Miles rubs his eyes and stifles a yawn. Harmon loosens his string tie and stretches his arms above his head. You know, if the colonel were here and saw you yawning, he'd take his cane and slam it down on the table. <laughs> I'd love it when he does things like that. Finally, Harmon lets Miles get a few hours of sleep. The next morning, Harmon picks up Miles at 7 for a tour of his KFC stores in Salt Lake. At the first store, Harmon walks into the kitchen and leads Miles through the process of how to fry the company's tent pole product. He calls the training how to do chicken right. Mike, you see how I slip the chicken gently into the hot oil? You got to do that or you'll burn your face off, but it also keeps the flour mix from slipping or clumping up. Harmon drops the exhausted executive back at the airport at 4.30 p.m., four minutes before his flight boards. Bye, Mike. Remember, you can turn this situation around. I believe in you. Miles takes Harmon's training to heart and designs a back-to-basics program for the whole company. He calls it recolonization. He throws out some of the new non-chicken menu items like barbecued spare ribs and recommits to the Colonel's recipes. He also starts an incentive program with awards for franchisees. And he comes out with a new Harmon-inspired ad campaign. Our chicken taste. No one else can do. Kentucky Fried Chicken. We do chicken right. In just three years, store sales jump more than 50%. It's a miracle of a turnaround. But just as KFC is rising from the ashes, Harlan Sanders dies on December 26, 1980, at the age of 90. Four days later, in the Kentucky State Capitol Rotunda, thousands of mourners filed past a flower-filled casket where Harlan Sanders' body lies in state. Some slip handwritten notes into the folds in the satin lining. The colonel would be pleased with a send-off. John Brown, who's gone on to become Kentucky governor since leaving Highland, gives a heartfelt eulogy. Boy Scouts form an honor guard and line the streets. Funeral ushers wear black string ties. Mourners bury Sanders with their own special honors, but Highline is resurrecting the colonel's chain. It's the fastest growing division in Highline, with store sales showing a 73% jump since 1978. But the bump is short-lived. And that's because Highline raids the hen house, diverting Kentucky Fried Chicken profits meant for expanding and advertising into its sagging booze business. And that leaves the franchise vulnerable to fast food rivals. Between 1980 and 81, Chick-fil-A doubles the number of its franchises to 200 restaurants in malls across the country. And it's about to get even hotter in the kitchen. It's 1981 at the Perimeter Mall in the north side of Atlanta. Hundreds of shoppers mob the entrance of Chick-fil-A. Many of them hold coupons clipped from the Atlanta Journal. One woman waves hers in the air above her head. Hey, you guys, come on. I don't have all day. I want my free slice of pie. Inside the tiny store, the panicked young woman at the counter tries to calm people down. Please stop yelling at me. We're temporarily out of pie. Everyone with a coupon, please come back in half an hour when we'll get a new delivery. I hope. In the meantime, would anyone like to order a Coke? We have Coke. The coupon promotion is part of a major Chick-fil-A campaign to counter McDonald's first fried chicken sandwich, the McChicken. Chick-fil-A's new inexperienced advertising exec launched the coupon blitz in top-tier newspapers. The response is breathtaking. Hordes of bargain hunters in multiple markets are mobbing stores. But they'll have to wait. Everything on the menu at Chick-fil-A is made by hand, including the free slices of pie and sandwiches. The overwhelmed kitchen staff is drowning in a sea of orders. By the time the staff sweeps up the last crumpled coupons, all the free food has cost Chick-fil-A $2 million, wiping out their advertising budget. And the fumble couldn't have come at a worse time. 
Over the last few years, the company drained its accounts to open 255 locations in malls. Now, the 1982 recession is washing over the country, and developers aren't building any more malls. And as people's budgets are stretched tight, fewer shoppers head to those malls. Chick-fil-A owner Truett Cathy is watching the interest on his first mega loan of $10 million snowball. It's money he borrowed to build new headquarters before the recession. Now, he's afraid the flashy new digs will be his $10 million tombstone. And there's another problem. Popeyes is on a roll, or rather a biscuit-driven surge, and they're in a gambling mood. They're about to risk it all to overtake the alpha hen, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Your time is precious. So why waste a bunch of time trying to juggle all your expenses, invoices, bills, and business travel when you can use Expensify to manage it all easily and seamlessly? Expensify is an easy-to-use app that makes it easy for you to get paid back. Simply put, Expensify helps you manage your expenses, bills, invoices, travel, and business or corporate card spend all in one place so you can focus your time elsewhere. No more worrying about losing receipts. Just take a picture as soon as you get it and toss it. Better yet, link your credit card and Expensify will auto-match the receipt to the expense and submit the report for you automatically to your manager. And if you're an admin, you can use Expensify to digitally manage your company's money so you never forget a receipt, bill, or invoice again. See why Expensify is the most widely used expense management app in the world with over 10 million users. Visit Expensify.com BW to get started with a free trial. That's Expensify.com BW. It's December 1982 in Beaufort, Georgia, 40 miles north of Atlanta. Christmas trees, wreaths, and holly festoon the halls of the Lake Lanier Lodge. But in the conference room where Chick-fil-A's senior management gather, the mood is anything but festive. Truett Cathy turns to his oldest son, Dan, who's just 29 but already showing promise as a strategic thinker. He's also starting to lose his hair, just like his dad. Dan, why don't you take the lead on this? What do you think we should do? The other executives look expectantly at their boss's heir apparent. They imagine he'll suggest his father sell the company. After all, Truett's 61 and close to retirement. Dan turns to the nervous employees. Let me ask you all this. Why are we here? A senior vice president fidgets with his pen. He's wary of crossing the boss's son. Do you mean how did we get ourselves into such a mess, or are you actually asking what do we live for? Dan points at the VP. That's it. Now you're getting it. Before we decide what needs to be done, we need to know why we're doing it. What is our higher purpose in life? He turns to his father. That's what you taught me, Dad. All those years following you around in the restaurant and at church, too. It's what we often ask at the company weekly prayer meetings, and the answer is never just to make money. So I think we need to get our values straight again. Let's all pray on this before we get started. Everyone around the table bows their head in silence. Like his father, Dan Cathy is a deeply religious Baptist. Prayer, tithing, serving a higher master. These are practices that are second nature to the Cathy family, as well as most of the Chick-fil-A staff. The nine men in the room spend the rest of the day distilling their mission statement. At eight o'clock that night, Truett prints it out and brandishes the sheet of paper. All right, let's see if this is a keeper. The question is, why are we here? And our answer, to glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us, to have a positive influence on all who come in contact with Chick-fil-A. A young regional director slowly raises his hand. Um, I, I think that is so inspiring, but what exactly do I say to franchisees about how we'll save ourselves from bankruptcy? <laughs> yeah. yeah well, that's what I was thinking, too. Yeah, me too. Truett rubs his hand over his smooth head. Yep, David, we had that coming. Well, I guess you could say we are fully committed to getting you guys through this tough patch and to growing for the future, 
And no matter what, we're not selling this company. What Truett lays out next may not be God's plan, but it could save Chick-fil-A. He commits to investing in freestanding stores that don't need to rely on mall traffic for success. It's a financial leap of faith, but the trust the company shows in their franchisees empowers them. In 1983, a year after a big sales drop, revenues soar by 35%. Malls aren't in recovery, but Chick-fil-A is. The resurgence of Chick-fil-A feels like divine intervention. At Popeye's in New Orleans, Al Copeland is praying for a very different kind of miracle. It's Christmas Eve in 1988, downtown New Orleans. Hundreds of cars inch by Popeye's downtown headquarters. Drivers crane their necks out of the car windows trying to take in the half million lights that twinkle on the building. Copeland watches from his seventh floor office. He's 44, his face still boyish thanks to plastic surgery. Popeye's is now the third largest fried chicken chain in the country with 700 franchises across the U.S. And Copeland is wealthy beyond his wildest dreams. He has a mansion on Lake Pontchartrain, two Rolls Royces, and five speedboats, including a 50-foot catamaran, which he's driven at 130 miles per hour to set world speed records. Right now, he's riding high on the success of Popeye's new biscuit rollout and a tremendously popular ad campaign featuring the Loving That Chicken at Popeye's jingle. He turns away from the window to face his new CFO, James Kilborn. He just stole Kilborn away from Church's fried chicken earlier this year. He left about the time that rumors were circulating that Church's put something in the spice mix that made black men sterile. Jim, from the way you talk about how Church's old CEO has lost his touch and how they're struggling, and now this bizarre rumor going around, well, it makes me think it's time for a hostile takeover. Kilburn glances out the window at the extravagant $50,000 holiday light show and turns back to Copeland. That's true about churches. They've overexpanded, which makes them vulnerable. They own all their real estate and almost 70% of their stores. So you could dump the failing locations and sell off the competing ones to our Popeyes franchisees. Down the road, you could clean up, but Popeyes is also carrying a lot of debt. It's a huge gamble. Copeland grins like the street tough he once was. They don't call me Louisiana Liberace for nothing. What's life without some risk? And anyway, we can finance the whole thing using these new high-yield junk bonds. He says it's like printing money. Everybody's doing it. He's referring to deregulation in the bond market. For a while, it creates a Mardi Gras atmosphere on Wall Street, which is flush after inventing new ways to leverage debt and finance corporate securities. High-yield and high-risk junk bonds fuel a takeover and merger mania. Copeland leaps into the fray just before the fuse is lit. He buys churches for almost $400 million, the sale largely financed with high-yield bonds. Five months later, Copeland sits down for breakfast, unfolds his morning paper, and reads a shocking headline. Famed Wall Street firm Drexel Burnham Lambert declares bankruptcy. Drexel, one of the largest investment banks on Wall Street and the company that created the junk bond market, has filed Chapter 11. Copeland rushes to call his CFO. Jim, what the hell's going on with Drexel and the bond market? If the bottom falls out, I'm toast. That loan payment's due soon, and I'm not going to be able to pay a dime. Within months, Copeland defaults on his loans and declares bankruptcy. His gambit to be the new chicken king implodes. He loses ownership of Popeyes to his creditors, but manages to retain the rights to his recipes and the company that supplies the seasoning. His bid to catch up to Kentucky Fried Chicken is over. But Kentucky Fried Chicken has little to celebrate at the start of the new decade. Its new owners, PepsiCo, are focused on the global market, particularly China. Meanwhile, health-conscious Americans are shunning fried foods. A reckoning is coming. It's 1991 at a Marriott Hotel in New Orleans. Pete Harmon and 10 top franchisees sit across the conference table from PepsiCo senior management. 
Harmon's left his string tie at home in Utah. The company has changed hands twice since the colonel died, and none of his new bosses know what the company stands for anymore. The new head of KFC Worldwide pushes a contract across the table to Harmon. Pete, this is the contract we have with our other fast food franchises, Taco Bell and Pizza Hut. Kentucky Fried Chicken has traditionally offered some of the most enlightened franchise agreements in the business. But this new contract is generic, and in Harmon's opinion, abusive. As Harmon reads it, it's basically, accept our terms or you're going to have to deal with PepsiCo, and it won't be pretty. A few months later, Harmon and the top ten earning franchisees sue PepsiCo for breach of contract. PepsiCo counters by preventing them from opening new stores. The suit lingers on for seven years, and sales flatline. Franchisee morale and store conditions deteriorate. The chain's image is a ghost of its former glory. And in a bid to capitalize on the health trend, PepsiCo removes the word fried from its name and erases the last vestige of its personality and its connection to the colonel. It's now simply KFC. In the next episode, animal rights activists rebrand KFC Kentucky Fried Cruelty and Chick-fil-A belly flops into a culture war over same-sex marriage. From Wondery, this is Episode 5 of KFC vs. Chick-fil-A for Business Wars. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating and a review, and be sure to tell your friends. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen one week early and ad-free. You'll also find some links and offers from our sponsors in the episode notes. Supporting them helps us keep offering our shows for free. There's another way you can support the show, and that's by filling out a small survey at wondery.com survey and tell us which business stories you'd like to hear. A quick note about recreations you've been hearing. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said. Those scenes are dramatizations, but they are based on historical research. We use many sources when researching our stories, but we especially recommend Josh Ozersky's Colonel Sanders and the American Dream and Secret Recipe by Robert Darden. I'm your host, David Brown. Barbara Bogave wrote this story. Karen Lowe is our senior producer and editor. Edited and produced by Emily Frost. Voice acting by Michelle Phillippe. Sound design by Kyle Randall. Kate Young is our associate producer. Our executive producers are Jenny Lauer-Beckman and Marshall Louie. Created by Hernan Lopez for Wondering. 